Today we're going to be talking about how you walk the walk. If you're saved, that's good. But how do we live that Christian life? How do we live that Christian life? The book of Romans is arranged in a very systematic way. In those first five chapters, they are dealing with our salvation. How we become a Christian. And the big word for that or theological term is justification. That is, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are declared or made righteous by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And then in these verses, in these chapters, chapters 6 through 8, they deal more with how we are to, to live our life. And that is a, that's a big theological word, sanctification. You know, a lot of people would, would just really like to, to, to be saved and it'd be over with. We're perfect. But that was not God's plan. Our sanctification is a day-to-day -day process. We just keep working toward perfection. Mama is perfect today. Two days ago, she wasn't perfect. Today, she's perfect. Today, we're not perfect. As a child of God, I think we all want to live the Christian life the best we can. In Romans 8, verses 1 through 4, it tells us we can live it, and we can only live it, we, when we understand, and look at your first point there, our new position in Christ. We can only live the Christian life when we learn and understand our new position in Christ. There, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Interesting use of words there. I looked up different translations and how they translated that word. I think the easiest way to translate it is this, condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Not one little iota. The understand is that God is a loving God, but God is also a holy God. And there is not one sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed that God will overlook because he is holy. Now, Paul makes the astound, astonishing statement here. He says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in. That is a big word. To those who are in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? Well, I, I'd like to use an Old Testament story. Through the years, Carmelita has... She has collected Noah's Ark junk, I mean uh, uh, stuff, <laughs> and a lot of it. But she's thinning some of it out. Even when I've been overseas in different mission projects or whatever, I've always brought her, bought her something, Noah's Ark, and brought it back to her. And I want to use Noah's Ark as kind of an example or illustration here and I want to say again, if you haven't been to see the ark, I want to suggest to you, you go. Because it is overwhelming. <laughs> and you've probably read your Bible as much or more than I have, but you, you cannot comprehend the massiveness of that structure. And I hear they're, they're building the Tower of Babel there, or, or attempting to. So that so that'll be be there too, but uh, God decided that this world got so bad, so wicked, that He was going to judge this world. 
And God said to Noah, he said, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood and cover it inside and outside with pitch. That means he sealed it on the inside and the outside so that anyone that was in that ark would not feel any of the judgment that was coming to the world. Let me put it this way. Not one drop of water got inside that ark and did not get on anybody that was in the ark. So Noah got the ark ready and he got it all built and I wish I was in a black church today because they would really help me. <laughs> Noah got that ark built and he drove a bunch of stakes on the outside of it. And he looked at his family and he said, Family, come and hold on to these stakes and pray that the waters of judgment don't knock us off. Now, if I was in a black church, I can hear them running, Reverend, no, no, Reverend. My Bible doesn't say that. No, Noah didn't build that ark and drive stakes in the ark and ask his family to hold on to the ark. The Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. Now, the NIV, and this is one reason I don't like the NIV, the NIV says that God said for him to go into the ark. He didn't tell him to go into the ark. He told him to come into the ark because God was already in the ark. So if you've got an NIV, go burn it today and get you a good Bible. But some of the other translations mistranslate too. Let me say this to you. The old King, you can you can say what you want to about the old King James Bible, but it's as close as close can get. But he said to come into the ark. And his family inside the ark were protected from the waters of judgment. Not one drop of that water that fell fell on any of those that were in the ark. As, the, as this verse in Romans says, there was therefore no condemnation to those who were in the ark. No, not a drop of judgment fell on them. So if sin is going to bring wrath upon us, you and I need to get somewhere where wrath has already failed. Somebody asked one time, do you know the best, you know the safest place to be when the woods is on fire? where the fire has already burned. Two thousand years ago, Jesus Christ died on Calvary. When he died, God condemned the sins of the whole world. When you come to Jesus Christ, that means you come to a place where the wrath and judgment of God has already been placed. What a safe place to be. But if you're lost, let me say this to you, your judgment is ahead of you. We went to uh, Branson, Missouri one time and went to this Noah's Ark presentation they had there. And... Uh, they, it, it was a beautiful, beautiful... Well, you were sitting inside the ark. The, the theater was like sitting inside the ark. I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but uh, it, was, it was just awesome. And then they shut the door. And Noah and his family were inside the ark. And they shut the door. And you could hear those folks outside the door saying, Noah, we believe. Noah, the water is rising. Open the door. But you know, it comes a time in our lives 
when God shuts the door. And the door will not be opened again. The Bible says that my spirit will not always strive or work with or encourage man. There comes a time when God just stops. The wickedness of the world was so bad in Noah's day, he had Noah to build this ark. He gave him very specific instructions in how to build that ark. And when it was finished, he said, Noah, you and your family go into the ark. Come into the ark. Uh, I've become an NIV man then. Come into the ark. And when they came into the ark and they were safe in the ark, God shut the door. And no one else came in. But if you're lost, your judgment is ahead of you. John 3, 36, the latter part of that verse says, He who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But listen to this, But the wrath of God abides on him. The judgment of God abides on him or her. But if you're saved today, verse 1 says, There is no, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There was no condemnation to those folks, those folks in Noah's day if they were in the ark. There's no condemnation to you if you are in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus gave us a warning in John 8 three times. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall die in your sins. You shall die in your sins. Jesus was saying that you are in a dangerous position if you are not in Christ. You're going to die in your sins. If you die in your sins, there's no hope. I'm going to miss my mom. But I know where she is. And she is not facing judgment. She's facing a glorious time with the Lord. You know, we talk about seeing our family and all of that. And when we go, you know, that's not going to be the best part of heaven. The best part of heaven is going to be to see the one that died for you and died for me. And mom, we, we, you know, I said a while ago, mom was probably looked up Virginia and saw Virginia. When did you get here? But I think she ran to Jesus. And said, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Because you see, absent from the body, present with the Lord, if you're in Christ. But if you do not know Christ, you die in your sins and there is only judgment ahead of you. Let me say this to you. Don't die in your sin. Don't do it. Now that's... This has nothing to do with how we live our life if we're in Christ. If we're in Christ, that just says, it tells you about your position, you, where you are. You are in Christ. It does not tell you how well you're doing in that Christian life. It's not talking about your performance. It's talking about your position. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. The Los Angeles Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals are going to be playing. I had to look at that because I'm, I haven't watched professional football in a while. But football teams have many players. They, these two quarterbacks, Joe Burrow from Cincinnati and Matthew Stafford for the uh, Rams, they're quarterbacks. That's their position. 
football teams also have linebackers, centers, halfback, running back, and you could just go on down the list. But these terms tell you the position they play. It does not tell you, and, and I, I, I mean, I've, I've read some about these two quarterbacks. They're both really good. But they're quarterbacks. And that says nothing about how they will play today, how they will perform today. It could be any quarterback. That's his position. As a child of God, the Bible says we are in Christ Jesus, but that does not tell us how poorly or how well we are performing that task. You know, I think today one of the problems of Christianity is I think we've been missing a bunch of practices and we're not doing too good. If you're going to live the Christian life, we need not only understand our position in Christ. Secondly, we need to understand our new power as a Christian. It says in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Do you see two laws there? The law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. Here's how it works. You give your life to the Lord. You know that God has forgiven you of your sins. You know you ought to live right and you don't want to live wrong. Can I hear amen on that? then somebody cuts you off driving down the road. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Or you're just flipping through the, the television and there's a, these lewd pictures and the old sin, that old sin, uh, uh, law of sin leaps up and grabs your heart and mind and you just stop and lustfully look. There is so much garbage on TV today. I remember when I was young, and it, mostly it was our Pentecostal brethren, you know, they were preaching, just throw them things out in the front yard. Well, here is a Baptistocostal brother says that's what we need to be doing. It's just garbage. You know it's not up to the standards of the way a Christian life ought to live, but you just go ahead and do these things. The law of sin and death restricts you, chains you, binds you, and takes you captive. Sin and death always go together. Kind of like bacon and egg. They belong to one another. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And here again we see in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. People die in their sin spiritually because of the law of sin and death. But when the law of sin and death works in a Christian's life, when, when we sin, it brings death to a Christian. That's when we have those weak moments and we just say those not, un, not kind words to somebody who cuts you off driving down the road. Or they not, may not be verbally heard, but they're in your mind and heart. It may bring death to a relationship. This is why Christian couples break up. That's why Christian marriages go to pieces. 
Because when sin gets into a marriage, there's only one thing that's going to happen, and that's death. It kills that relationship. It also, when we allow sin and death to come into our lives as children of God, it kills our testimony. It kills our testimony. You know it's inconsistent with the way Christians ought to live, but you go ahead and do it anyway. And it kills your testimony. And then folks go around saying, I'd become a Christian, but I don't want to be like so-and-so down there in your church. There is that powerful principle that restricts us, that law of sin and death. But there is another law that is found in that verse, and it's in the first part of that verse. Look at verse 2. It says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. That means not that I can't sin anymore, but that I now have the possibility of victory over that sin in my life. As a Christian, now there is operating in you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a power that, that lost people don't know anything about. As this song sang a while ago, they sang this song, He is here. Reach out and touch Him. That is the power you and I have to have victory over sin. Don't spend your time condemning and putting down lost people. They don't know any better. And they don't have any power to live any other way but that. Amen. What we need to do is put down those Christians that are living ungodly lives that have the power not to and don't use it. Amen. I've got to calm down. Carmelita said some one time, she said, why in the world do you get so excited preaching in them rest homes? She said, most of them people don't even know you're there. I said, yeah, but I'm talking about the same Jesus there that I talk about in church. Amen. But they don't, they, lost people don't have any way. They don't have no power to do anything but what they do. But you and I who are in Christ Jesus have a power. We have the Holy Spirit not just in this place, but in this place. And we need to utilize that Holy Spirit to help us to live like God wants us to live. What does Christian mean? Christ-like. Everybody used to wear those little bracelets, you know, the what would Jesus do bracelets? And I've seen some of them that they forgot they had that bracelet on. Huh? It's just a natural thing for lost people who live outside of Jesus and outside the power of the Holy Spirit. But now when you come to Jesus, there is a new power that is operating in you. Ephesians 19 and, and 20, or 1, 19 and 20, it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead? What that is saying is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from that grave and exalted him back into the throne lives and breathes inside of you and me. He is here. Reach out and touch him. Use that power to be a, have a good testimony in this world. You have the Holy Spirit that can overcome any sin in your life if you'll just rely on that Spirit. Here's the third truth in these verses. We can live the Christian life when we understand our new potential as a Christian. Look at verse 3. It says, 
For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. The law here is not a principle, but a power. The law here is a reference to the Old Testament. And not just, not, not just the, 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 the Old Testament, but we'll say the Ten Commandments. Because they were part of that law. Before we talk about the Ten Command, what the Ten Commandments could do, let's talk about what, it, what they couldn't, could do. The law, Ten Commandments, are a mirror. When you get up in the morning, do you go in the bathroom and look in the mirror? Why in the world do you do that? <laughs> I told Carmel the other day, I looked in the mirror and I thought, is that me? I didn't know, and I know y'all will not say amen or nothing, but I didn't know I looked so bad. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you when we get on. But why, why in the world, why do we look in a mirror? The very same reason I don't like pictures. Because it reveals exactly who you are. The Ten Commandments are that way. They're like a mirror. They show you your real self. Because I guarantee you there is none of us in this place today that can say we have obeyed every law. Not driving laws, but the law. She's going to be coming down here with one sign. She's, you don't pay no attention to them signs. I'm, I pray she pays attention to the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the only thing the law can do is show you who you are. And it shows us that we are all failures. The Bible says we all miss the mark. But as a child of God, you have a power within you that can help you to change that and to get better and get better and get better. And the older we get, the more mature we ought to get, not only physically, but spiritually. Now, I want you to I, I, listen to me. I, I approve of putting the Ten Commandments in our schools and wherever else we can. But the Ten Commandments are just a standard. And they will not change people by themselves. They're just a mirror. We, you are not going to improve behavior by just putting those Ten Commandments on a wall somewhere. Verse 3 there says in Romans 8, For what the law could not do in it, that it was weak through the flesh. Why can't we live by, the, by those laws? It's not that the law is weak. The flesh is weak. We are weak. I like to smoke meat. And I would like to think I'm pretty good at it. I've been doing it a long time. What disturbs me is I cook ribs and I'll cook a Boston butt and I cook a brisket and I cook my all beef bologna. And they like the bologna better than anything else. Because they're full of no, I mean, <laughs> But I do like to smoke meat. I, I like to I like to put a Boston butt on the smoker and I just put it on there and I'm out there just fooling around in my woodshed or out in the yard and I let it cook for about eight, nine, ten hours, real slow. I I smoke it in a paper bag. You think it don't burn up? No, it don't burn up. 
best way to cook it. And I've tried everything to get those that, that meat off of my smoker. I've bought these big, you know, these things, you, you, big hooks like, you know, you stick in your meat and try to, that's no good. I've tried forks, that's no good. You know, the only thing, the only way you can get that meat off of the smoker or the best way is what I call it a big spatula. You just slide it up under that meat, slide it up on that spatula, and you bring it out, lay it on some tin foil, wrap it up real good, and then I put it in a cooler to let it finish cooking. But with those forks, that meat will just fall all to pieces. Now those forks, they are well and good. There is, there is not a fault in the fork. The problem is with the meat. It just falls all apart, falls to pieces. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with the flesh. The problem is with us. Our flesh is not able to live it. But it gets better. Look at, look at the, the, the latter part there of verse 3. He says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. What you have now is not, not the weakness of the law keeper, but you have the work of the law keeper, the Lord Jesus. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't sin, he was without sin, but he came as a person. At every opportunity, Jesus lived right. Have you ever thought about it? He was always right. And he was a man. <laughs> You'll get that after a while. He is different from us. He was not born with original sin nature. He was born of a virgin. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Yet when, there, when every temptation came by, Jesus lived right. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That simply means that all, that all the sins of the whole world were laid on Christ, and God smashed those sins of the world in the person of His own Son, Lord Jesus Christ. That's what He did for you, and it's what He did for me. It ought to cause us to just clap in gratitude for what He's done for us. And then verse 4 says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He's saying that what Jesus did for us on the cross, the Holy Spirit is able to make real in us on a daily basis. How do we live it? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's a beautiful picture of the Christian life. It's a walk. And every day we need to walk closer and closer and closer to the Holy Spirit. Closer and closer and closer. Get to know Him more and more and better and better every moment of the day. Some people want the Christian life to be something instantaneous, but it's not a sudden experience. It's a walk. It just doesn't work that way. You have to walk. You have to yield to the indwelling Holy Spirit every day. I can't say to you today that I am consistent in my Christian life. I, I would, God would strike me down today if I said I was. 
because he knows me better than you. But every day I pray the same prayer. Lord, I'm weak. But Lord, I, I, I am yielding a little more to you today than I did yesterday. And I want you to help me. I want you to help me to live the Christian life like you want me to live it. And then I still fail. And so do you. You know, there's a difference. And don't bring this picture up till I tell you, Giselle. There is a difference between an automobile and a trolley. Now, I know we're making electric vehicles, but they have the same problem. A car does well as long as it's full of gas. And you've noticed that it costs you more to have that tank filled up today. But the problem with that car is it goes well until it runs out of gas. And then it stops. It has a limit. Bring up that picture this trolley, I'm not sure they still use this trolley. This was down in the Bourbon Street. But I want you to notice something about that trolley. You see, that trolley is not running on its own power. You see that little arm going up to that power line? That trolley can only move down that track because it's connected to a power source. You and I can only live this Christian life when we stay connected to the power source. That power is in you. That Holy Spirit is there. It's available to you 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But what do we do? Sometimes we just come to church like going to a filling station and we get a little gas and we go out and try to live our life and we run out of gas and somebody pulls out in front of you and hang on, hang on, But if we're going to live the Christian life, somebody will, somebody will see this on, on the line. They'll say, well, he's talking in tongues today. <laughs> the only way you and I can live the Christian life like God wants us to live it is stay connected to that Holy Spirit. Stay connected. And you'll be able to move along through this world like God wants us to move along in this world. Because God wants us to be a good testimony in this world. Because as people see you living, people will want to have what you have because they don't have it. It always blew my mind, even when we rode our motorcycles and and stuff. Uh, I remember getting we got all we got off our motorcycles and we were going in to get something to drink, some water probably, because a lot of times we'd take a sip of water and then we just pour the rest of it on us. But I remember one time we par parked at this little quick pick, I think it was, and I had my leathers on and I was taking my helmet off. And this person was sitting on the back of a car. And she hollered at me. She said, will you come over here and pray for me? I said, what makes you think I, I would pray for you anyway? She said, you look like a preacher. My hair was really slicked back from that helmet. I said, what makes you think I'm a preacher? I said, look at me. 
She said, I just think you're a preacher. Will you pray with me? I said, ma'am, I appreciate you, you saying that to me. But I'm not worthy of that. But I prayed with her. I wish every day of my life somebody would see me walking and say, you're a preacher. But every day of my life, that doesn't happen. Wouldn't it be good for all of us as we go through our days of life, of living, every day somebody says, would you pray for me? I know you're a Christian. Let me leave you with this. You can, and I can, as long as we stay connected to the power. And the only power that is available to us to help us live that way is the Holy Spirit that is in our hearts as we are in Christ Jesus.